So Thank I'm going to be briefly talking about some of the attract and kill that we're working with with spotted wing drosophila. Most of you are familiar with the attract and kill. The goal is to uh, bring in a specific pest to a specific region that then you can annihilate that pest and you can use less uh, insecticides uh, that will have reduced effects on your beneficials. It's kind of the same idea that you put these ant traps in your house and set up blasting your entire house with insecticides, you can put these ant traps down and pull them into a certain area and kill them. So before we get into spotted wing drosophila, uh, apple maggot fly is the system that has a very successful uh, attract and kill method. This is Ron Procopy. He was at the University of Massachusetts. He's a behavioral ecologist and entomologist. And he came up with this idea of these sticky spheres that mimic an apple and uh, the apple maggot will fly toward it. It's visually attracted and lands on it, so you can monitor it. And if you hang enough of them, you can actually reduce population sizes, and then you reduce injury. And uh, later on, because no one really wants to work with sticky spheres, they get all over you, they're, they're really messy, uh, the Lesky Lab developed these things that we call attractocidal spheres. So instead of being sticky, uh, they have a plastic base and a wax cap. They're also visually attractive to the pests. You can put an old factory stimulant in the cap so you can have an odor attractant. And we put sugar in the cap, which is a feeding stimulant, and then a toxicant. So flies see this, they're attracted to red, they think it's fruit, they come in, they land on it, they pick up the sugar, they start feeding, they ingest the toxicant, and they die rapidly. And that works really well for apple maggot fly. Um, so this is a study that was just recently published. And the take home message is basically, uh, whether you spray the, for apple maggot fly, whether you spray your entire field or you just line the perimeter with these spheres, you get the same quality of control for apple maggots. Um, so you're putting a lot of less uh, insecticide on and you're getting the equivalent control and the equivalent damage as if you spray the entire block. So this is the goal, right, for our small fruit growers. That's what you're trying to sell. Uh, but spotted wing drosophila comes along. It's an invasive species, uh, so it doesn't have very many native predators here. And this is typically what you can get with the uncontrolled uh, infestation. So you get fruit collapse, 100% uh, death, uh, fruit uh, rot, and uh, this has called, caused billions of dollars of economic damage uh, in the United States each year. So our obvious question was, can we use the attract and kill that was developed for apple maggot fly for spotted wing drosophila? And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to see if the same system would work. So, but first we had to see if it's visually attractive to the fly. So we set up some laboratory experiments, choice tests, non-choice tests. We also ran this in semi-field, and then we ran it in uh, peach and orchard, looking at the different kinds of colors that the fly might be attracted to, the different kinds of shapes that the fly might be attracted to, and different size spheres also. And the basis of this uh, paper just came out this year is that spotted wing drosophila are highly attractive to red and black colors. Uh, which makes sense. That's a lot of the fruit colors that they attack. Uh, there was actually no preference in shape and there was really no preference in size, which actually works well because that means the sphere that we developed for apple maggot fly might actually, you might get a two for one. It might also be useful to uh, use against spotted wing drosophila. Next we had to see can you kill, we know we can attract them with these spheres, but can we kill spotted wing drosophila uh, with the attractocidal sphere? So we did a large amount of uh, laboratory lethality tests using 10 potential toxicants uh, with five minute feeding, placing the flies on, flies on and then monitoring mortality. And uh, I'm just gonna quickly show you, there's a lot of good stuff that works. So after 24 hours, which is the green bar, you have 100% of mortality. Uh, some of these are organic, so you can use it in organic systems as well as conventional systems. And some of these actually were killing 100% of flies within the five minute period. So you're removing that fly from the system immediately and it's not gonna be laying eggs uh, and, and damaging your fruit. Because it's an invasive species though, we don't really know anything about its foraging behavior, right? So no one studied this fly because in its native region it's not as, uh, it's not as big as a pest. Um, so we don't know, we know we can kill them with the tractocidal spheres, but we don't know where you would place them. So would you place them at the top of the tree, in the middle, or at the base of the canopy? And we also don't know if we could get away with a perimeter-driven deployment, or do, would we have to um, 
deploy spheres on every single plant. So I wanted to study some of the foraging behavior of the pest to see if we could uh, put the spheres in the right spot. And uh, the first thing we did uh, was we bought some store uh, purchased raspberries and uh, we put a little bit of glue in the top of them with a paper clip so we could hang them in, in laboratory and cage trials. Um, and that would show us over position. So you could hang, hang these berries, flies would lay eggs, and then you can count the number of larvae in the fruit. We also wanted to look at alightment, so where do they land? So to do that, we took the same berries and we coated them with tangle trap, which is just the sticky material. And you can hang that at different points uh, in, in, on a plant, and you can see where they prefer to land, because they're going to get captured on there. And the first set I did was in, the, uh, in, in cage trials. So we took a large cage, put one single potted raspberry plant in there, removed all the fruit, and then we put sticky berries uh, at five heights on the inside and the outside layers of the plant. We released 120 flies in each cage, and then 24 hours later we would go and count the number of flies on each of the berries. And when you look at the data for landing for alightment, you can see there's an obvious preference for low position fruit. So the flies like the low position fruit, and that's whether you release them at a high level in the cage or the low level. They're going to go down to the lower level fruit. And uh, for over position, so we took those berries in and dissected them and counted the number of larvae, you see the same pattern. There's a preference for the lower position fruit. So that was uh, in cage trials. You wanted, we wanted to repeat this in the field because sometimes you get very different behaviors with these insects from the inside and the outside. Uh, so to do this, I set up these raspberry plot semi-field trials. So these are potted plants, uh, for four reps, and I wanted to do a mark, release, recapture with these. Um, so we have this stuff, this uh, day glow powder, it glows in the dark under UV lights. Um, and I've done a lot of work with brown marmorated stink bug and you can just basically fire the stink bugs in a garbage bag, throw the powder in the garbage bag, shake it up and release them and they're fine. That doesn't happen with spotted wing because it kills them. The powder is really, you know, messed with their wings and stuff. So we had to devise a new way of marking them. And we came up with this method of using these medical powder puffers that give a very precise small amount of puff. And if you do that into a graduated cylinder, you kind of get what I call a powder cloud. And I can release the flies in there. They will actually fly through the, the dust cloud, labeling themselves, and it doesn't affect their mortality or their biology. So we tested that in the, in the lab. The marking didn't affect them at all. Uh, when it's done this way. And that's what they look like under UV light. So you can see the glow in the dark bug and you can monitor their movement and their dispersal and their potential preference in the field. So to test this in the field in those plots, we took sticky berries and we put sticky berries on each of the plants. So there was over 900 sticky berries in those field plots. And I released 5,000 marked flies at each of the points and I marked them and placed them two meters outside of the field plot because I wanted to see what it would be like when they're coming in from other potential wild hosts into a plot. And then I had an army of undergrads that volunteered to go out and uh, search for plants with me at night. And we found that in those vials out of the 5,000 in each, each uh, release point, only less than 2% did not fly out of the vials. So that's given me more evidence that this marking technique is a good technique that they can fly and they do leave the vials. And then for the recapture, I got two, two point, a little over 2% recaptured and I only found them on the sticky berries, which was interesting. So we searched the entire plants at night. We searched the surrounding wood line, blackberries and adjacent blueberries. The only ones that were recaptured were on the sticky berries. So there's something interesting going on. We, I was expecting to find more of them maybe resting on leaves or, or around uh, the plots. Uh, so there might be some daily movement um, between wooded tree lines, um, possibly that they're going up there at night and then moving back down uh, in the daytime. Because the only ones we captured were the ones that landed on the sticky berries. Uh, again, we did see the same pattern though. The sticky berries that were positioned lower on the plant captured more flies. We also saw a strong edge effect. So we're releasing them on the outside, the flies are moving into the plot, and we capture a whole lot more flies on the outside edges compared to the inner, inner rows, leading us to think that maybe we can get away with that perimeter-driven uh, sphere deployment instead of a gridded system, which will be a lot cheaper and uh, less person hours. Uh, however, again, those mark flies were laboratory reared because I needed thousands of them and that's the only way to get them up. Uh, and I wanted to look at the wild population of flies as well. So what's happening outside? So to do that with those plots, I removed all the fruit 
from all of the uh, plants every two days for two weeks. And I cleaned up all the fruit on the ground also. So I believe that that's a very sterile plot at that time. There's no real heavy population of spotted wing drosophila in those plots. And then we hung sticky berries, three sticky berries again at each at three heights on every single plant. And uh, we, we left them for 48 hours to look at the wild population. And you can see, again, the same pattern. They're preferring the low plants. So when they're coming in, even the wild ones, laboratory ones, there's the same pattern we always see. Uh, and there was a strong edge effect as well still. So they prefer the exterior rows. And again, these were very small plots. So I only had five rows. And if you think about a commercial edge, if I'm seeing an edge effect on five rows on a commercial orchard, you're probably going to see a stronger edge effect when they're moving in. I don't understand. You have both exterior and interior about the same. So exterior is row one. In interior is row two. And then the center row, because there's five. So the, yeah, so that's the, this is actually row one and five. This is row two and four. And that's the center row three. So that's, yeah. Um, so that's under low population pressure of spotted wing drosophila. We also wanted to look what happens when you have a really high population of the insect. So we let the fruit develop for two weeks, um, didn't control anything. And at this point, these fruit are just dripping with spotted wing drosophila. So we have an enormous high pressure population. We repeated the study and uh, you actually get a different pattern. So under high pest pressure, uh, they kind of spill over and there's less preference for the bottom fruit. And uh, again, there's a bit of an edge, edge effect still though. Uh, took some overposition data from that, so we collected the berries from those plants. We took them into the lab, we let them develop, or we stored them for two weeks, and then counted the number of flies emerging. So these again are wild flies that are, that are laying eggs. And uh, surprisingly, we see the opposite trend. Uh, where I found a whole bunch more flies and fruit at the top. And that was a little confusing at first, uh, but I was removing all the fruit from those plants and in, instead of doing a subsample. And it turns out there's a whole lot more fruit at the top than the bottom of the plant. So we're repeating this and I'll control for the number of fruit sampled. Um, and I think that's what's actually driving the overposition data. It's just because there's, in these potted plants especially, there's no fruit down here. Um, so we wanted to do a field experiment. I'm pretty confident that you can kill these uh, flies with these spheres. Um, so we did a field experiment where we put the attractocidal sphere on each plant in some plots. Other plots had a weekly insecticide treatment without spheres. A third one had spheres and insecticide treatment. And then we had an uncontrolled, con uh, unmanaged control plot. And when we look at the infestations, you can see, yep, if you don't control spotted wing, you get a whole bunch of flies in your fruit. Uh, but the sphere and the insecticide sprays had equivalent protection. And even more interestingly, if you have a sphere and an insecticide treatment, you get even further reductions. And that's probably because in between those spray intervals, that sphere's there. And as flies are moving in, it's still constantly killing flies. So you get that protection in, in, in between sprays. Uh, right now, we're looking at how long we can put these spheres out in the field and uh, the longevity of them. So we have uh, some laboratory tests where we expose them to these UV lamps. Uh, we also created this uh, rain gear. So this would uh, mimic one inch of rain per week put down on these uh, spheres and the, and the UV sun. And uh, this is just the preliminary data after six weeks exposure to these. We're still getting high kill rates on the flies after five minutes of, uh, after five minutes of exposure to the sphere. Um, so that's promising. We will be running this further to see uh, what the efficacy is at 12 weeks as well. Uh, so conclusions, uh, yep, it does look like uh, spotted wing drosophila do have a preference for the low hanging fruit. Uh, Kelly Hamby is going to be talking. She has some data that supports this same idea. Um, so there's a couple of things. She'll be talking about the microclimate possibilities. And uh, one side sort of uh, observation is that these are some of the flies that lay eggs and ripe fruit. So most flies don't do that. And that's kind of risky from an ecological point of view because from a plant perspective, ripe fruit is designed to be eaten by birds or mammals so the seeds are dispersed. So if you're putting your eggs in something that might be eaten, that's pretty risky. But birds, there's been a lot of literature have shown will, because of their anti-predator behavior, will consume berries that are on the top outside branches 
of, uh, of, of orchards and trees because they don't want to be down on the ground or on the inside of the plant where their predators can grab them. Um, so there might be an ecological selection pressure, the reason why these, in addition to microclimate, why these flies are preferring the inside lower uh, fruits to lay their eggs in. Um, with that, I had a whole bunch of help from a whole bunch of people in our lab, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And if you can please fill out the survey, that'd be very helpful for us. Thanks. Yeah. When you released your, 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 your laboratory rays, you bottling the soft and you only, only captured 3%. What do you think that 95% was? So, with mark release recapture, 2% is a statistically usable number because a lot of the times they just go out of the system, they get blown away. I was surprised that I didn't find a single fly on a leaf or hanging out in the pot. My personal opinion is that they might be moving to the tree line. Uh, there's been some studies from Asia that have shown that if they were putting up sticky traps in the top of tree canopies in the forests, uh, and then they were actually looking for other forest pests, and they were catching spotted wing drosophila. It's just in a little table note, a little footnote, that they caught this insect that is in, not a big pest over there. So I'm wondering, especially in small fruits, uh, it might be better for those flies to go up and hang out under a canopy of a forest because of wind and water or rainfall. It might be a better pr protection and then they might be moving back down in the day. We see that with brown marmorated stink bug as well. That they, they, they have a, sometimes they have a, a, a daily movement pattern. Um, but we're, 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 uh, we're working with the uh, Department of Forestry to look at that this summer, whether they're going to the trees. We don't know them. Yeah. Yep. Did you use inside these spheres the same as you did with the uh, other bugs? Uh, we used ten. We used uh, the graph that I had up there. We used ten potential insecticides. So there's organic ones, and that that paper will be published in the next probably two weeks. It'll be in Economic Entomology. Um, but organic insecticides worked, and conventional insecticides. So there's there's actually you've got a choice of highly effective killing agents. Thank you very much. Thanks.